Today we are joined by celebrated technology author and the former editor-in-chief of Wired UK, David Rowan, IDC powerhouse and group VP for enterprise software, Mickey North Rizza, and Massimo Capocha, chief innovation officer at Infor. I'd love to ask all of you kind of the same question, and that is, as we look ahead at the year coming, what are some of the trends that you see over the next couple of years that have the potential to overcome some of the adoption obstacles and barriers that we previously identified? Um, Mickey, let's go ahead and start with you. I already chatted a little bit about how organizations, the collapse of some of the enterprise apps and everything coming together from a holistic perspective. That's one thing, but I really think what's going to happen here is we all enjoy speaking much more than we enjoy typing and clicking on something. So if we can start interacting with our technology in such a way, you know, not just, you know, voice to text and sending somebody a text, but having the conversation of, I need your help. I need to understand whether it's Siri, it's whatever that I'm sitting there talking to, that device and the name that we come up with it for. Hey, I need your help. Can you bring together this, this, and this and help me understand what the predictions look like if our market is going to go in this direction? And oh, by the way, I need you now to introduce, we've got some additional supply chain concerns. What do I need to be doing from a supply chain aspect to help solve this problem, right? So I think it's going to be the interaction of technology, I think is huge right now. And that interaction will shift the way an employee does their job. David, is there anything that you see in your crystal ball that you think is really going to take the market, the industry by surprise? Well, I don't like crystal balls because they imply inventing something. Whereas I look at the data points, I look at the edge use cases, I look at what's happening in China, which, because they have a government mandating things, creates different types of behavior. But I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the last 10 years being the time we digitized every sector, the next 10 is going to be when we automate every sector. We embed autonomous decision-making in everything. AI won't be talked about. It will be like electricity. It will just be there. And that's going to mean deep personalization, the conversations that you have the way you educate people, the way I track my well-being before I become unwell. So it changes how we think of healthcare. Um, every organization needs to now start thinking, which of our processes can we first automate? Where are we going to create efficiencies? Where are we going to spot changing behavior among our customers? And can I say something that might upset Massimo. Is that all right? Am I allowed to? Yes. Share your opinions. No problem. So this word innovation, I think, gets a little misused. And I became obsessed with this because I kept going to corporate offsites and there was the innovation team and you pressed them on how they were changing the company. But often it wasn't much. It was, oh, well, they're listening to us. And I wrote a book with a title that you'll probably not allow me to say. So you're going to beat this. It was called non book innovation. I went to 20 countries looking for examples of incumbents actually getting it and building the future. And very few of the success stories had chief innovation officers. Very few had an innovation department because that makes it one person's problem to solve. That makes it a team that's not part of the core culture. And where I saw amazing innovation from the fertilizer company in Norway the gaming company in Helsinki, it came down to empowering everybody in the team to find out how behavior was changing, to find out how they could change their work to make it fit more closely into customer expectations using technology, but crucially, to find ways to suggest to the core company how it needs to change. And if you can recruit amazing talent and then empower that talent to work as it sees best, you are going to have a company that is future-proof. That's a great point. Massimo, let's give you a chance to kind of address 
some mm-hmm. of the challenges and, and the the issues that that David so rightly ex- explained in terms of the word innovation. Yeah. How do you see that, and how do you how have you evolved that at imports to really make it a competitive advantage and yeah. a differentiator? No, absolutely. I agree, I agree. You know, having a chief on innovation office or someone that does innovation doesn't mean that oh now that company will be innovative. You know, you have to apply that to that to the to the fabric and the DNA of the company. So that means that you will have goals and targets to really you know put the innovation at at, at first. You know, it's just not on paper, but it's on execution as well. So at Infor, you know, we started to be Build, you know a platform for the innovations for for our applications where you know all the innovations like it come, come from AI or automation it's built in in the product so every engineer or every product manager will work on the innovation so it's the agenda topic number one and it's just not on paper so it's the execution part is also very important and that is what is my role at info actually uh, as well I love that the execution that's absolutely yes critical. It's not a nice to have for organizations. No. It's table stakes. Absolutely. Mickey, I want to bring you back into the conversation with respect to the trends. How do you, where do you see organizations prioritizing their investments and in some of the trends that are really at the precipice of, of breaking through? It comes down to how they can shift their business into this digital world. Again, similar to some of the things that we've been chatting about, it's getting them to that tipping point where they see the advantage of something coming forward. It's typically done by a use case, right? So David was talking a little bit about the edge, going to outside the industries, trying to learn different things. But when you take those learnings and come back in, it's working with companies like Infor that have that innovation to say, look, I want to push this envelope here. I want to go outside this box. I want to be able to get more value on the front end here, but also on the back end. I want to be able to fulfill fill faster, right? And it's not about me just building more factories. It's more about me using what I have and maybe tipping it up a bit with some innovation in my particular factory, but then also going to the edge to bring that information back to say, how is this actually helping me or hurting me? So it's trial, it's error, right? It, it's finding the, the area that makes the most sense for your business to grow from, and then taking that up in from a reality standpoint, putting it in the business, going through the change management to get to that next level. Now, candidly, you could be like some of the automotive companies where it takes you a while to get this through and you might miss the opportunity to create a new value stream. But also, I want to say, you could also be like that other automotive company, Tesla, where they took advantage of it and they took it to a new height. Again, that's where, to David's point about watching the VCs and where the money's coming from, that's where some of these new edge areas start to evolve too. But it's understanding how that's going to come forward and where you're going to go with it. Absolutely, that's critical. Mickey, how how should organizations go about adopting and onboarding emerging technologies in a way that allows them to be agile, but also again, deliver that business impact that you were talking about? It isn't, it isn't an overnight thing where you just drop in and drop a bomb and walk away and hope that it's all gonna work. It just doesn't work, right? I, it, it's really about working with your partners, your technology and your services folks to help understand where's your business now? And you've created this value stream of where you think it needs to go. You're looking broadly. You're getting to that next avenue. You know where you want your business to go. But you also have to step back and say, what pieces can we do now? What pieces can we do later? What's our investment strategy look like? And then stepping back to say, okay, let's go out. Let's start to bring this in. But bringing it in means what area do I start with? Do I start with a line of business? Do I start with a manufacturing facility? Do I start with one particular brand or area within my company that I can actually control and watch this start to come forward? Take those learnings and then bring them forward into that next area. Because the biggest thing that happens when you bring in innovation, technology, new ideas and whatnot is the change management that's around them. You know, we're all humans. Nobody likes change. And to to see the art of the possible in the future, while you may see it, you may be so stuck as an employee that you can't figure out how you're going to get there. So it really involves a team around you to help you bring yourself to that next step for your organization. I love that you brought up change management. That is, you're absolutely right. Nobody likes change. That's the one constant. Muslim, from the change management perspective, mm-hmm. pivot on that. How is How can that be an accelerant of organizations adopting and onboarding emerging technologies in an agile way? Yeah, so actually agile is a good word. I think one other aspect is the duration of adopting a technology. So uh, companies have very, you know, well, there is change management, there is a cultural shift, you know, there is all that kind of aspect. There is also a in a financial aspect, like, okay, if this technology, if we do that wrong, then it, it could be impact us, you know, from a, in a big way. 
So having a very circular type of duration. So for instance, it, at Info, we do uh, six weeks projects, innovation projects. So um, with very less impact from a financial perspective, if it's experimentation. So if that doesn't go through in a good way, it doesn't have a big impact versus if it works, then it has a huge impact, right? So we work with the customers and just a six weeks projects implement, you know, a, a use case that they think that it's very valuable for them and then, you know, go through another use case. So six weeks to six weeks instead of doing one or two, three year projects. And then at the end, figure it out that we spend all this money and we didn't get any outcome to it, right? So, so the duration and very small, agile, engage with the customers, deliver the value and move to the another one. That is the good way to introduce innovation and manage cost, cost and manage change management, essentially. Great advice. David, bringing you back into the conversation, when you're out talking with organizations and you've talked to so many, yeah, the breadth is, is amazing, you've clearly run across early adopters. What are some of the key characteristics that they embody when it comes to successfully onboarding emerging technologies? A combination of humility, curiosity, and a willingness to play. So this, I think, is true in big incumbent organizations. <clears throat> you don't know how the tech is going to affect you, is going to create new business lines, is going to risk existing revenue streams. But if you are prepared to put a chunk of your budget into exploration with no immediate pressure for financial returns, you will probably find something using the tech that you can apply to the business. And, you know, I've met a frying pan company, one of the world's biggest frying pan companies that saw the internet coming to the kitchen, the connected cooker. What if it downloads recipes? You won't need a conventional frying pan. So they created an internal startup with a connected frying pan that downloaded recipes from the internet. And the idea was you may subscribe to recipes like Netflix. It may not work, but they're experimenting. And through that process, they will learn how to embed technology to create better project products that are what the customer wants tomorrow. With startups, they've got a lot less to lose. They don't have existing business lines that are potentially going to evaporate. So they can take massive risks. But again, it comes down in the culture of an effective startup to playing, reading the data, observing and pivoting quickly if it doesn't match your expectations and constantly experimenting and evolving. But it also comes down to hiring people who are humble and curious and resilient, but who have an open mind. So I think it's less about having the answers than being prepared to ask all sorts of absurd questions. Another thing they have inside Google X is a culture, what they call psychological safety. You're never laughed at if you make a proposal, if you suggest, what if we did this? Because they want any idea to be listened to. They want everybody to be free to propose something, no matter how absurd it is, which could just be part of the future. Absolutely. I love that. The theme of exploration, curiosity, uh, freedom to fail and, and learn from that and move on is, is just so poignant and, and really underscores what you guys all said. So I want to wrap this episode up, Massimo, with you. Mm -hmm. And tell us, if you can, in one or two sentences, what can we expect from Infor in 2024? A lot of things. Uh, so what we are working is uh, really to bring the user experience to the next level, right? So we talked about the employee, the end users, the customers. And so until so far systems will get, give you the, you know, the, uh, the answers of, you know, what happened and when it happened. And mostly it's, you know, business intelligence, BI, um, combined with some reporting. But what we're really trying to get to the next level where we want to infuse AI, so the artificial intelligence, so give predictions on things you know, for a certain role, but also bring the process intelligence. And so in the acronyms world, you know, it's AI, BI, and PI, 
together. And so that essentially you get the, the questions, you know, what happened, when it happened, why it happened. Right. So and give you the end users, you know, more power to, you know, insights. Uh, that's that's really what we are working. Think about, you know, when you try to go through A to B in Google Maps, you turn on traffic and now you know how to go to A to B in a in a good way. If you want to serve a customer and you want to do it in the best way, if you have that traffic insights in a, on a dashboard and, and not only to understand what happens now, but the prediction that maybe if you want to serve this customer, not to go from A to B, but from A to C in this way, that is where, you know, the next level optimization and sophistication we are working on. Next level optimization and I'll yeah. tell you talked about empowering the end user and great advice for the audience to adopt and onboard emerging technologies in an agile way. We appreciate your insights and your time, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps up today's episode of Double Click. A huge thank you to our guests, Mickey, David, and Massimo, and to all of you who have joined us today. Goodbye for now. We'll see you next time. <laughs>